So we've got 30 minute talk with Tammy and I'm not going to do any introduction for Tammy um, and instead I'm going to hijack that and say as a co-organizer of the just approved WordCamp Brighton with Tammy, I'd just like to say um, uh, keep your eyes peeled and follow us on the, the WordCamp Brighton website and please do come uh, this summer in Brighton and make our first WordCamp a success. Um, and without further ado, uh, I'll pass you over to Tammy. Thank you. So, everything we make has a design pattern underneath. It can be broken down and distilled to patterns. And when you think in terms of patterns, well, the design process starts to kind of make sense. There's lots of different words that are used and you hear them in every article from atomic design to components to pattern libraries to style guides. There's just so many terms. It feels like there's a new term for the same thing coming out every day. But what it is, is actually about looking at common elements and distilling down a design into smaller manageable parts. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But first, a little quick introduction about myself. I actually work at Automatic. Uh, this is a company behind WordPress.com, as long as lots of other different things. And what I do day to day is I actually focus on UX within the theme team. And so thinking about things like design patterns is something really, really important to me. And I love watching users and finding out how we interact with the designs. And we all, as humans, we are really the ultimate pattern recognizing machines above anything. We have this ability in us to recognize patterns, and it's natural. We don't have to learn that. We're born with that ability. And we quantify the world by patterns because it's comforting to us. And I don't know about you, but the world can be really, really confusing at times. And patterns, they make things understandable. Our world is made of patterns. From the smallest flower to the largest architecture, nature has patterns that we then follow in creating our own world. So at first, we identified the patterns of wild animals. And we use this knowledge to hunt and to also avoid being hunted by animals as well. And then later, we identified the patterns of the moon and seasons and provided us with the knowledge then, by knowing that, to be able to farm and do agriculture. And our long-term memory contains descriptions of many, many patterns. It's not something we're conscious of, but it's a fact. And I find that incredible. When we see or hear something, we then compare it with that. So I'd like to share a quote that I feel really brings home the importance of how powerful we are and, and this, this kind of skill that we have in us that we don't always recognize. You are a creative genius. Your creative genius is so accomplished that it appears to you and others as effortless. Yet it far outstrips the most valiant efforts of today's fastest supercomputers. And all you have to do to invoke it is open your eyes. So that quote was by Donald Hoffman. And I don't know about you, but for me, that brings home how powerful what we have up here is and how we should be tapping into that. There's a theory that I think is relevant when we're trying to think about design patterns. And that's the recognition by components theory by someone called Irving Biedemann. Now, he used it to explain object recognition. So what it is, is you separate objects into 3D shapes, which are also called geons. And from that, you can then recognize to build different objects. So you can see you can build a telephone, we can build a lamp, but it's the same shapes. If anyone here went to art school, you probably remember when you learned to kind of draw, you break a shape down, you break an object down into shapes, and that's how you learn to recognize those, particularly from life drawing. And using this theory, we can then build objects visually and recognize them. So 
So how does that apply to the design work we do? We have this natural ability. How do we kind of tap into that and maximize that when we're designing? Well, design patterns have actually been around for a long, long time, way before we were doing this digital design thing. And Christopher Alexander originated the architectural concept of patterns. And this was a way to describe best practices, good design, and kind of capture the experience to reuse, a way to formalize it. And he kind of had this, this pretty grand notion of a pattern language as a system which the whole was greater than the parts, just like any language, but it would be about design. And he would use it as a way of describing good design practices within a field of expertise. And this is something that's, that's a kind of a pillar of design. And it's something I think sometimes we forget when we're starting to do digital design. So as I said at the beginning, in simplest terms, it means breaking down to the smallest design elements and then building up. And yeah, there are variations and all those kind of buzzwords and all those kind of terms. So whenever I'm faced with quite a big idea, and I find this is quite a big idea, I try and relate it to something that I understand. And for me, in terms of design patterns, it's Lego. Because Lego makes sense to me when I think of it in terms of this, because you have the bricks, the components are built from bricks, the patterns are built from bricks, a link that goes to others, then forms a navigation block, so walls to a house with Lego kind of makes sense. And you're looking at the interface patterns. And a pattern library is a collection of patterns. And it can contain a spec for each pattern, but it's not just about each pattern in isolation. It's about how it connects with each other. And each pattern then builds up to create the whole. You can see this a little bit like Lego kits, if you're like me and trying to relate it to something to understand. And if we begin to use design patterns, how does this actually change our process? Well, the current work process of a lot of designers, I would generalize to possibly be a little bit like this. Maybe some more to and froing, um, maybe some even more complication. It's very, very hard to get from the start. It's varied, it's probably a different step each time. There's no, uh, process, it, it just doesn't feel organized. There's no shortcuts, you're not learning, it's hard to try and get in, it, it's a hard process. And the ideal process would have less steps and be simple to follow for anyone, so you'd be able to start kind of learning this process and then people would be able to understand the designs that you're creating as well, which is really, really important to us. To get someone to buy in to a design, they have to understand it. So entire sites, if we bring it back kind of from the psychological, from the kind of design into the digital world and onto the web and what we create. Entire sites have patterns. Business sites have patterns. Sites for restaurants, there's a pattern for them. If as I'm saying this, you're probably thinking of getting a visual, you know, a musician blog. There's a visual that comes from these things, a photography blog. And looking at these patterns and looking at the way these designs are formed, pattern analysis is something we should be really doing to look at our place in the market before we actually create something. Because there are these common patterns and we have this visualization when you say that. And I'd like to look at a couple. Because by starting to see designs in terms of patterns, you start to see the connections and you start to see these interaction patterns. Reliable patterns that have worked over and over again, navigation, selection, filtering, sorting, message, messaging, notifications, and so on. It's so many different patterns. So this is the BBC website. And to one side, you can see a complete view, and then a kind of more zoomed out one. I find when you zoom out, you start to see the really obvious patterns like this. This has a really strong visual hierarchy. And if you're looking, I would say, for an easy example of a content-heavy site that works really, really well, this is it, the BBC website. And then the Boston Globe site, for example. 
This is also a great example of how patterns that exist in the print world can then translate into the digital world. A newspaper is a tried and tested pattern that you understand. You understand how to use it and engage with it because it's kind of part of our visual DNA now. And zoomed in, you can then see the refinement of the design. And part of starting to think in patterns is beginning to recognize them. So how does that actually work in practice? Well, you can start really starting to think in patterns by starting with research. I would, if you do anything, just start, everything should start with research. Before you do anything, before you design anything, start with some research. What I do initially, whenever I'm going to create a design, is I look at the market. I look at the type of thing I'm going to create. I focus on that. I gather, I call this a magpie stage, because you know when magpies grab every shiny object they possibly can? That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to get all the input. I don't care where it comes from. It could be the material world. It could be digital. It could be a bit of music that makes me think. It's all those kind of patterns, in, even patterns in music, that patterns I'm trying to get that input to then create. So let's take an example. Uh, imagine I'm going to create a food blog. So I look at common food blogs. What are the commonalities? What are the things that make? What, what do I think of when I see a food blog? What, what are there in the top food blogs? What are there in, in the ones that I can see around me and I can do research on? Where does navigation go? What are the common patterns? And from this, I then look at why they are common. So some of them might have a lot of sense. They might make sense for common. And some of them, they might be because they were just recently in an article of trends. And that's not what you should be looking at. Those are kind of UI red herrings. What you want to be focusing on is, do they really make sense for that type? Does that pattern, is that pattern bringing something to the users of that? And by distilling these patterns down, you can further do prototyping, and also user testing can confirm your hunches. And I'd strongly suggest you do this as a designer. User testing and confirming your hunches, even at a really early, it's, it's painful sometimes showing stuff at an early stage, but we need to do that. We cannot be a judge of our own work. We have to get that input. So it's worth mentioning, I tend to kind of remove all design from patterns, at least in analysis at the start. I kind of call this, it's just a me term, block views. So what I'm doing is I'm just looking purely at the structure. And then I'm boiling it down and refining it. It's a little bit like looking at an out of focus picture and then really, really bringing it in to focus. And patterns are easier to see initially in blocks. So going back to the food blog screenshots, there are two distinctive patterns that I found. I did a lot of research, looked at a lot of sites. So this featured image of a grid, and then there's a traditional, in many ways, two-column blog layout. And this is the two-column blog layout reduced to blocks. So for me, this is super helpful because I can see the pattern straight off, right? You can see where this is. When you take away the visuals, you take away all that kind of visual fluff from the picture and focus purely on the structure, you start to see it. And it's quite a strong structure. And I found this in a lot of blogs was used. There was a similar strong structure. And then this is the grid layout. And only by doing that magpie phase did this grid layout come to kind of be something that would be for food blogs. I would actually have thought this would be more common for something like a portfolio blog or photographers. Turns out it's actually really common for food, which kind of makes sense if I actually thought about it, because people take pictures of food. And there's a lot of gorgeous food photography. Um, we've got dinner coming up, so it's the kind of thing that makes you super hungry and you look at. <laughs> I found this actually was a really, really common pattern for food blogs. And I'd not have guessed that without doing the research. And you can also analyze these patterns further. I kind of take a next stage where I group similar elements with similar colors. So I know where, what our navigation on the page. Maybe they're orange, or maybe they're green in this sense. And then I know where the footers are, that's orange. And then the, the hero image, that's yellow. And I do this so I then 
bring out the visual elements. And I'm still not looking at the visual fluff. I'm st now I'm labeling it and categorizing it. And then you can start to drill down and see the details. And after this, I start looking at the design, but only after I've done this, because I really want to get that pure analysis, that kind of pure patterns. So if thinking in patterns makes sense, which I hope I've shown it does, that we do that naturally, and that doing pattern analysis, I hope I've also shown that, that that really makes sense for us. I don't know if you're asking, but perhaps you're asking, why would you actually go that next step and have a pattern library? And it kind of is like a three-step, you know, why would you have that pattern library? Well, let's first of all take a look at what pattern libraries are, and then hopefully I'm going to show you why, when you're talking about design patterns, you really should be using pattern libraries. <coughs> so I like Lego, so I'll go back to Lego any time. So let's go back to Lego. You also have sets in Lego, right? For instance, you have a pirate world set. Well, that can make a pirate ship, but that can also make an entire fleet, it can make a city for the pirates. The entire pirate world, you can make lots of different things out of that pirate set. That's your pattern library. I'd like to just clear something up when I'm talking about pattern libraries, because this kind of gets a bit muddy sometimes when people are talking about it. A pattern library is not a design library. Design libraries contain typography, grids, color, and code. Design pattern libraries or design patterns are not that. It's purely focused on interaction and UX patterns without what I call in my terms the visual fluff, without that kind of extra stuff. It can actually be part of the design library, just like style guides, and generally you would include it to be that. But what I'm talking about here today, and what I'm really trying to focus on, and try and convince you to start using if you're not, is the pure structure. So why would you do it? Well, let's think of a few reasons. First of all, this to me is above all the easiest for me to say to you, and that's speed. We all are time pure. Poor. We all need to kind of get better processes. Quite simply, when you use a pattern library, it's faster. You don't reinvent the wheel. You're grabbing existing things pre-built and then using them as a solid foundation. And there's a heck of a lot of speed increase in that. You're going back to the Lego idea. Would you really build every brick each time? Or if you were going to build like lots of different houses, would you carefully produce, you know, do the walls and then break it down to parts. That's how you do it. You'd have a process that you do. And then iteration. Iteration is something we don't always get a chance to do. A pattern library also allows you to build on the good work you've done. And we don't get that enough, I don't think, in digital work sometimes. We don't get to optimize what we create. And to not have to start from that dreaded zero every time, I find is priceless. It's a chance to refine, to rework, and stand on the shoulders of our previous work. And along with that comes sharing. You get to share the code amongst each other if you're working as a team, but you also get to maybe share the code, because we're an open source community, with each other. And that's really useful as well. And then consistency. Consistency is really, really important. If you have a team, then you, then you need to ensure that your code base is consistent. That's a priority. But you also need to make sure that your design is consistent as well. You can, for example, in terms of code, have class names uniform and have a consistent coding style throughout your projects, and you should be doing that. But in terms of design, not having like hundreds of different versions of red. Have one correct version that you're using. Keep the design to the minimum and lean approach to doing it so it's focused. If you're working in themes, perhaps, for a network, maybe you want to have consistent UI elements for the same things across that network. And you can do that by all using a design library. 
Salesforce actually used a pattern library. And the notion of a single source of truth, I really feel, sums it up. You can filter this through to all platforms you use as well. The pattern library is the one place to go, the shining light, the way everyone can understand and can be assured on that point. I think it sums it up perfectly for me. It's that kind of uniting. And you can be sure to stay on brand, and it keeps that unified experience for everybody. And we also have understanding. That's a great reason to do it. Because with design, we sometimes have a bit of a hurdle for people to understand what we're creating and get on board with our design. And it also makes sure that everybody is speaking the same language, no matter whether they, whatever kind of stakeholder they are, they're all speaking the same language language, maybe they're a developer, maybe they're a designer, whatever, they're all speaking, they understand it, and it's inte intelligible to them. This one place allows that, and it crosses the bridge between those different roles. And also, in terms of understanding, the pattern library should also be easy to understand. And usually it can be in a browsable form. Uh, I would strongly suggest it should be in a browsable form because you need to be able to dip in and get the information. If you're hiding stuff in a kind of big bucket of a pattern library, that's not a great approach. So pattern libraries contain the foundations of what you're going to create. And by recognizing patterns, you are knowing the foundations of design. And once you do that, you can build anything. Just like the geons, the UI patterns of our shapes. Any design project can easily get out of control. Who's, who's had a design project get out of control before? <laughs> like 50 different shades of blue, <laughs> loads of different things. It happens. It happens so easily. You just put something in, and it kind of maybe someone put something in Sketch, put something in, and then when you're coding, put something in CSS, it very, very easily can get out of, of control. And one of the nice side effects of working with pattern libraries it means you can fight that. You start consciously designing. You're aware of the value of everything you're adding because you're putting it into that library. You're aware of that. And you're conscious of every single pixel, every single line, and then when you encode every single CSS line and every single little bit that you put in, you see the worth as it goes into your library as you check it in. And this is incredibly powerful and helps you create a lean approach to working. And conscious designing means more optimal designing. You're designing the best you can do because you are going through a process that makes sense to you as a human and you're being conscious about everything you're doing. So you might be thinking, and sometimes people, a lot of people do, in fact, Mark Barton did, when you're talking about this, isn't this all a little bit mechanical? Design is something you feel, right? And I'm talking about process. What about creativity? All this structure, all the planning, maybe that doesn't feel that it feels right to us. The thing is, Mark actually has a valid point. What I'm actually suggesting you focus on is not a design manufacturing process. I want you to keep the heart in everything that you create. I want you to create the best designs that you do. Because patterns actually exist. And Mark goes on in this article to recognize and acknowledge that. When you take the design away and you focus on the patterns, you still have that process but you get all the benefits of the library and none of the repeated design issues. And if you find yourself blindly picking from the library, or in this terms, creating the same cupcakes over and over, you're not being conscious about what you're designing. You're not being the best designer you can be anyway. I'd like to share an Aesop's fable. I love stories. And this fable is of the fox and the cat. So, the fox had lots and lots of different ways to escape and was pretty much bragging about this to the cat. The cat knew one escape route. The hunter came and the cat escaped straight off. 
because it had one escape route. The fox was kind of going, <laughs> deciding which way it went, and got killed by the hunter. Not a very pr happy story, perhaps. <laughs> However, <laughs> it does have a moral. The moral is, it's better one safe way than a hundred on which you cannot reckon. Because you cannot create in a paradox of choice. Humans just, we do not work that way. That's not the way our brain works. If we're given a o totally open playing field, that doesn't help our creativity. That really stifles it. What this is about is knowing the notes of our music, understanding the hues of pain, and having your tools laid out in front of you. Because, as I said before, for far too long, we started from that zero when we create on the web. And part of leaving the door open for creativity should come in seeing this as changeable. As you do analysis, maybe other patterns need to come in. And creating a pattern library is half the story. You could argue that it's less than half. It needs to be open, alive, and constantly tended to, not just left to go stale. And by seeing things in patterns, we're starting to think of the future. Components, it's a word we keep on hearing. It's becoming the norm in terms of breaking things down on the web, boiling things down. And dealing with an entire starter theme or framework starts not to make much sense with what we're starting to create. These small, reusable, lean, perfectly crafted components, that's the way things are heading. And when it comes to themes, themes are close to my heart, we tend to create a lot frequently, right? Who here makes themes? Do you make the same thing over and over again quite a lot of the time, yeah? A theme shop usually has a relatively high turnover of work. And there are common patterns, these patterns that we use time and time again in themes. And as a result, having one library that we use for all themes and generate it based from, that starts to make a lot more sense. And it becomes the central place for maybe your shop or maybe what you're creating. So I'll just be obvious about it. I'm going to point out the framework elephant in the room when I'm talking about this, because that could be the next kind of logical step. However, why would you not use a framework? And I'm going to be super general in saying this, because I'm perfectly aware that this is not the case for every framework or how you use it. But a framework, in general terms, is everything. It's not about picking from a library. It's about, slightly crude term, but shoving the entire elephant into whatever shape you want to put it in. I don't like squished elephants, um, so nobody likes to do that. A pattern library is similar to a well-stocked workshop. You have, as I said, all the tools and materials are laid out to create an amazing piece, to do your best work, to do that conscious designing. Use exactly what you need and nothing more. No bloat, no waste, no time lost. At Automatic, we are working on this now in the shape of our theme components. And as of yesterday, we just launched a new version of this using JSON files and generation. I'm super excited about this, and I really hope you check it out. This has no design. It's a really different take, but it's still, at its essence, got that pattern library. And currently, this has types of themes and then generates those. And over time, this is going to go beyond those simplistic themes format. And our next goal is to have a generator that you can use checkboxes to basically roll your own and pick those components. And then we will also have lots of different components that you can do that for. It's based on underscores still, but it's a componentized version of underscores. So it's kind of underscores exploded and then stuck back together using this generator. So I'd really encourage you to check it out. We're just starting with this, but our solution is going to be open source. And I hope you can join us in the journey of this. Pattern libraries, I hope I've shown you, make sense. And design patterns make sense for us to start using. Because we think in terms of patterns naturally. And learning to recognize this, it improves our ability. It makes us do that conscious designing, which means we create the best designs we can. We create targeted and efficient experiences. Pattern analysis and research should be our cornerstones of whatever we do. Pattern libraries also should be at the heart of the work we do. You, they don't limit creativity. They enable you to have more time, energy, and more enthusiasm to go beyond each time you create a new thing. And designing this way makes sense. 
because we're human. So thank you very much. My slides are going to be up. I actually have at the end of my slide deck some hopefully useful links. And I think I've got some time for some questions. Thank you very much, Tammy. That was really good. Within 30 second window of the 30 minutes, so <laughs> a pro. Um, so if you have any questions, can I see some hands? Any hands? We have a, um, we've got a hand over there. Nice. Um, thanks, Tammy. That was great. And really, I'm here. Do I go? Yeah, it should. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I promised Elliot outside I'd ask a question. <laughs> um, I am really excited about the underscores, and the last project I built was that, and it's, it's amazing just to have something that you can run with out of the box, and the way it's done in a way that it's not trying to be a theme that you make a child version of, that you just go with that. So very excited to check out the components. Um, I was just at a previous talk, um, and uh, I can't remember the guy's name. He had put together a project, Herbert, and it was, uh, I think it was taking learnings from uh, frameworks like Laravel and trying to implement uh, more conventions, or kind of Laravel-style conventions into WordPress. And I was just wondering if you had an opinion on those type of kind of patterns that are used in other things? Or? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, cool. <laughs> uh, that's, I would love to discover that. Um, so if you want to pass me any links to discover that, that would be great. Um, I, I don't know what larval patterns are in particular. Do, is there any synopsis you could pass on to that? Or? Yeah, I think but my understanding was from working with myself was they had looked at what Ruby on Rails had done. And uh, how uh, what, they, sorry? Ruby on Rails. Okay. Yeah, so I think they were kind of taking... Is that still that. design patterns, though, or is that code patterns? Because that's a different thing. It was, yes, it was more uh, code. Okay. Yeah, so when I say design patterns, I'm thinking of uh, object-oriented, okay, which I know we're not yeah. discussing. <laughs> I, I'm more focused on the, the, the front end. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm all for coding consistency because it gives a better user experience, but I will firmly be sitting more in the design and user experience side. Yeah. Uh, but I'm all for code consistency because it means that everybody's having a lean approach. Great, great, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Gerald, for that. Any other questions? I've got a question at the front row here. Great talk, really Thank enjoyed you. it. So uh, besides the theme components, what would you recommend as far as tools go for somebody who's not a designer to get started? In what? Just design patterns. <laughs> in in so learning design pattern, patterns? Creating a pattern library. So hopefully I've got some useful links at the end. Um, I would suggest that. I would also, so I, tools like any kind of bookmarking or any kind of way you can get images is great. Um, I use Sketch to actually pull my visuals out. So something like that. So you can actually start doing, if you're trying to start learning about patterns. Some of the great ways, just take like a screenshot of a website, put it into something like Sketch or whatever is your choice <laughs> of your, um, and then draw the blocks over it and you'll start to see these patterns. Um, with regards to tools, there's also um, some links, uh, there, there's lots of different approaches to it. Um, I don't want to kind of read off all my links because that's, um, I can actually flick through, that might be useful. So patternlab.io, uh, that has lots of resources on there rather than kind of just reeling them off at you. Uh, I'm all for everyone discovering their own journey of it as well, but definitely that block patterns would be, I'd start to do that. If you want to start seeing patterns and recognize them, then by doing that, uh, I'd, I'd suggest checking out components. I know you said besides it, because I would love people to fork that and do their own thing with it eventually as well. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any Thank you. more questions? Oh, just behind, actually. Just on, ooh, there we go. Hi there. Just a comment, actually, following on from um, uh, the gentleman there. I, I've used um, a website called Wi-Fi before, and basically... Um, mm -hmm. So what was that? Wi-Fi. 
Okay. Uh, and essentially, whatever website you want, it immediately takes a, a wireframe of that site, so awesome. you, can, you can automatically see the patterns there. So, is that like a, a browser extension? Yeah, yeah, it's a browser extension as well. So um, check it out; it's very useful. You should tweet that out with like the W yeah, London I will tag because <laughs> I'd like to see that. And if anyone else has got anything else to pass on. We got time to do that as well, so um, I'm all for like sharing information between each other. Sure. So all thank right. you. <laughs> and while we see if there's any other hands, I've got a quick question as well. Um, if that's right, I'll just hijack it. I'm not sure you're allowed. Uh, the the uh, underscores components looked really good. Yeah. Um, could you give an example of a component? Or have I, have I missed the point of the components? Uh, so components, yeah. Um, navigation. Navigation. Um, yeah. we've, so we've done navigation, the social menu. Uh, so in terms of underscores, we, the types have very specific components to them. Uh, so we have blog, magazines, so blogs kind of, but we have a like one page blog or traditional blog, which is like two column. <laughs> um, and then we have magazine, for example, or portfolio has the grid. So a component would be the grid portfolio. In general terms, a component tries to be the smallest design element. Um, so it'd be like the, the grid of the pictures. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and there was a, I saw a hand. Go up here, yes. If we could get a microphone there. Just want to make sure I understand. So would you say like wireframes are a little bit too detailed to be patterns or are actually, are they? So a wireframe still is a pattern. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it's, you're showing the design pattern in a wireframe. If you're on about when should you show things, I'm trying to understand what, 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 why you would, why do you think it's not a design pattern? That's probably a better approach to this. No, I, I, I don't think or not think. Okay. I'm just trying to understand myself because yeah. like when I saw the patterns that you showed, so my wireframes are a bit more detailed, so I was wondering yeah. if, if already putting any context so if you inside can, the blocks. I would suggest if you want to do pattern yeah. analysis, so for talking over you, I couldn't I can't quite hear people, it's awful. <laughs> um, if you want to do pattern analysis, I always suggest you pair back from any detail at all. But if you're trying to start to show the design patterns to clients and get them on board and trying to get that process, showing them a block view is probably not going to be very useful for you at that stage. Showing a wireframe, um, I tend to do super undetailed because a wireframe is a very broad word. <laughs> um, and then adding the detail in um, as I iterate on. I don't do freelance anymore, but that was always my approach when I freelanced. A, a wireframe still has a pattern in it. The pattern's under there. It's just with the design fluff, for a me word, um, on top of it. So it's still a design pattern. Everything, a full site, it is a design pattern. It's just about if you are trying to recognize those, removing that helps you with that, if, particularly if you're doing user research. Does that clarify at all? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, I just wanted to know you. that actually you even strip it down even more to start with. Yeah. Okay. So and a final question, anyone? Okie dokie, I'm not seeing any hands. So um, big round of applause for Tammy. Thank you very much. That was very good. Thank you.